Okay, again, thanks for the opportunity to talk uh, talk to you about, um, again, a, a topic that's near and dear to our hearts and has been uh, uh, an important uh, part of Rotary here for the last number of years. And that is this whole concept of clubfoot. And I know your club, um, with Ken's influence and uh, uh, Todd Becker's uh, uh, hard work that you know a good bit about it. But uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what it is and some of the involvement that Rotary's had in, in Clubfoot. Um, you know, Clubfoot is sort of a hidden uh, disability, a hidden disorder. Um, we don't see it. We don't see anyone walking around in uh, Cedar Rapids or Iowa City with Clubfoot, uh, untreated Clubfoot. Um, but in terms of the rest, much of the world, it's a, uh, it's an ongoing problem. Uh, it's really the most, as it says here, the most common musculoskeletal birth defect. Um, one in every 750 live births, uh, kind of a roll of the dice. Um, there's a bit of a genetic component, but, uh, a poorly understood one. And, uh, uh, and that amounts to about 200,000, uh, children a year being born with this, with a deformed foot, one or both. Uh, again, twice as common in males and it occurs in both feet about half the time. And, um, and just one foot the other half. And these are some examples you see here of um, um, kids in different locations, uh, Liberia, India, um, uh, South America. Uh, it, it, just, it just happens, okay? And we have 20 or 25 kids a year in Iowa born with clubfoot. Um, and you can, uh, the basic uh, quick, comments about why. As I mentioned, it's a um, more or less random um, uh, problem. Uh, it's not really, even though it manifests itself in the foot, clubfoot is not really a problem with your feet. It's a problem with the muscles and ligaments that control the foot. Um, there are about three uh, muscles and tendons in particular that are underdeveloped. As the foot grows, uh, these particular uh, structures kind of put on the brakes in their development somewhere in the middle of pregnancy, actually, the middle trimester. Uh, the rest of the foot tends to grow and, and these tendons and ligaments um, uh, and these couple muscles um, just don't allow that to happen normally, so the foot grows crooked, okay? Um, uh, it, it's uh, some of the other things you see here are, that are not causes of club foot. These are some of the explanations we hear in a lot of countries, that it's a moon, lunar eclipse. Uh, a common one is it's a curse from your ancestors, which is a common explanation for disabilities in, uh, in a lot of parts of the world. Um, unfortunately, it sometimes gets blamed on the polio vaccine um, and a number of other factors that you see here. And you can imagine in a, you know, a, a, a remote environment and uh, in a poor country with little education, something unusual like this happens to your child uh, uh, is born with this deformity, then you, um, you try to explain it. And uh, some of the explanations get, get very creative, actually. As I mentioned, it happens everywhere. I know you probably can't read this slide very well, but uh, it indicates the number of um, clubfoot cases that we estimate in various countries. You know, as many as, uh, you know, 30,000 in India, um, eight to 9,000 in Nigeria um, and uh, on down the line, essentially based on population and birth rate affected a little bit by infant mortality. So um, the clubfoot is everywhere. There's no, uh, there's no getting away from it. It is a global problem. Uh, here's just a couple examples of what it looks like untreated. Uh, this little guy on the left, the real one in Nigeria. Um, I happened to be in the clinic in Nigeria the day he came in and took this video. But you can see what kind of life he's, uh, he has and is likely to have uh, should he can, you know, have to go through life with his feet uh, turned in and flipped over like this. And the little guy on the right is 10 years old in uh, Brazil. And uh, he gets along a little better, a little older, but um, still, uh, you know, you can imagine the uh, stigma associated with this and the cultural um, uh, social issues. And the fact that in many developing countries, if you can't walk, you don't get to school. Um, you get uh, kind of squirreled away as a, um, you know, as a, as a disabled, strange uh, 
uh, little kid and don't have much of a chance in life. Um, I took out the I took out the the color pictures for this because I knew it was early in the morning and nobody wanted to see surgery, um, and kind of blocked out some of it. But the fact is, um, for uh, beginning in about the 1890s, uh, surgeons discovered that they could go in and actually rearrange the uh, structures that uh, didn't develop normally and make the foot look like a foot. And you can see here that. Um, it requires pins and it requires cutting a number of uh, lengthening tendons, cutting a lot of uh, ligaments and joint capsules and sort of rearranging things. And after an hour or two of surgery, a foot, the, the deformed foot looks like a, a normal foot. Uh, mom and dad are happy, grandma and grandpa are happy. Oh, wasn't it wonderful? The problem is that uh, the surgery is so drastic that by the time the child becomes an adolescent uh, or certainly becomes an adult, there isn't much uh, functional structure left in the foot. And you see the x-ray on the bottom right of the screen. Um, there's hardly any way to distinguish one bone from the next. It looks like scrambled eggs. Um, and, and, uh, and it is because the, the joint capsules and spaces and everything have just been um, basically uh, dissected as part of the surgery. So the result is that the quality of life by the time you're an adult is pretty poor. And the studies would show that by the age of 30, um, your quality of life is equivalent to having Parkinson's disease or chronic heart disease, meaning you can't go up and down stairs, you can't uh, walk uh, any significant difference, you have a lot of pain, and you're not very functional. And unfortunately, even here in Iowa, there are cases of uh, individuals who as adults have chosen to uh, elect to have um, surge, uh, amputation and are better off with a prosthetic limb and foot than they are with a useless painful foot. So surgery is not the way to go um, long term. It, unfortunately, there's too much of it still done on infants, but um, the data is unquestionable that surgery is not the long term solution. What is the solution is, uh, as most of you uh, certainly have heard and know a little bit about, is the Ponsetti method. Good old Dr. Ponsetti uh, arrived here uh, in 1941. He was assigned to look at some of the uh, patients who've been operated on in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, he immediately concluded what I just described. And that is as adults, surgery uh, just isn't the answer. And he vowed to, to find a better way to do it. And uh, what he developed is what's now known around the world as the Ponsetti method. Uh, if I were to describe it most succinctly, I would describe it as orthodontics for your foot. Okay? If you have crooked teeth, the orthodontist doesn't go in and do surgery on your gums and rearrange all your teeth and say, look, you've got a nice smile. The orthodontist, uh, I don't know if there's any orthodontist in your group, but the orthodontist uh, applies, you know, uh, con uh, very skillful pressure to your teeth to get the ones that aren't straight to straighten out into a line and to give you that nice smile uh, non-surgically or non-invasively. The same thing applies, uh, Dr. Ponsetti discovered in your foot, is that if you gradually apply um, uh, pressure and, and uh, in the right direction uh, long enough, the bones will reform the things that were short will lengthen, the things that were too long will shorten, will, too long will shorten and the ones that were too short will lengthen and the bones will realign and regrow just like they reform when you break your arm. The, the bones are very resilient and very uh, um, uh, plastic in terms of their ability to reshape. So he developed this technique. It's, um, it's not really all that complicated. Um, uh, it's difficult, it, it takes a real precision to apply, but here would be an example of, of, a, of an infant, maybe a week or 10 days old, um, uh, in, in which um, the physician, the, the healthcare professional, uh, applies some pressure in some very specific locations. You see where he's putting his thumb and, and what he's using as the fulcrum to, to manipulate the foot but then apply a plaster cast and just wait and let the human body respond to that new position um, and, um, and adapt. Uh, a week later uh, or 10 days later, uh, 
you would do that again. And you would take advantage of the fact that the, the uh, foot has partially reshaped, do some other gentle manipulations. None of this is painful. Um, do some other gentle manipulations, put on the cast and let it adjust again, just like the orthodontist progressively tightens down on the braces uh, uh, that, that kids wear on their teeth. And this would be an example of a, of a five uh, week um, series of cast, each one being uh, progressively moving more and more to a, uh, a normal position. And typically after four to six weeks, if you have a, a small infant like you see here, um, you can reshape this foot from being significantly deformed to being a normal uh, and what turns out to be functional foot. Uh, here's a here's a little bit of a time lapse of one of the patients. Each one of these is one week apart, and uh, you can see that you can uh, uh, progressively move the foot. And of course, just like with uh, orthodontics, the uh, the need for a retainer or to maintain the improved position is is important. And um, in this case, the uh, kids are required to uh, sleep not when they're active during the day, but they're required to sleep in a, a comfortable pair of shoes that are uh, uh, connected to a bar of some sort, uh, a fixture that will uh, prevent the feet from turning back. The, the genetic tendency for those muscles and tendons to be short is still there. Um, during the day when they're active and moving, it's just fine. They can be their normal, you know, terrible two-year-old or whatever they are at different stages. But at night when they relax, is when the structures want to reshape and go back into the deformed position. So um, a bracing is an important part of treatment. And of course, this part of the treatment uh, really depends upon the parents and the parents' conviction that they need to do this. And they need to, at times, hassle with the kids to put on their sleepy shoes or whatever you, you can do to con the kids into wearing these things. Uh, if, they, if they sleep with these um, uh, clubfoot braces on until they're uh, fourth birthday, they're out of the woods. The data, the statistics would show that the chances of a recurrence are just about zero by the time you get to age three and a half or four. Uh, the sooner that they give up on uh, the sleepy shoes and the, and the, the brace, um, the more likely they are for it to reoccur. If it reoccurs, you can recast, you can go through the process again, but it's, um, you know, it's uh, unnecessary if, if the kids, um, if the parents were able to, to follow through with the bracing protocol. And that's where Clubfoot Solutions and the work that Todd has been doing is so important because we've been able uh, uh, at, at the University of Iowa here to develop a low cost, um, highly effective, very comfortable brace that now I think we may have close to 100,000 braces in locations around the world and growing all the time. And, Todd is doing an absolutely spectacular job uh, spreading this globally. Um, as I mentioned, bracing is a problem. These are just some examples of, of braces that have been developed as people do the best they can with what they have. Um, some of these, you know, and usually local materials, often not high quality. Um, and of course, if the kids develop blisters and they complain a lot, then the chances are the, um, uh, the parents aren't going to stick with it. and uh, not so good. This is the Iowa brace. Some of you probably have seen this. Uh, uh, Ken, Ken is on our board of directors and, and uh, Todd, of course, is the managing director. And this is a, a device that we can supply to Nigeria, Pakistan, lots of places for about 15 or $20 instead of the uh, four or $500 that the uh, braces are, a lot of the braces are uh, cost here in this country. The beauty of the Ponsetti method is that it can be done anywhere. I mean, what does it take? It takes a skilled health professional that knows about the manipulations and the casting and the fine points of molding a teeny little infant foot uh, and um, some plaster, which is about as cheap as medical supplies get, and a good quality brace uh, at an affordable price. Um, so it's a, a method that's been, uh, that uh, has been promoted globally for about the last 20 years, there's still a long way to go to reach uh, every kid that needs it. Dr. Ponsetti developed a little bit of history here. Dr. Ponsetti developed this technique by the 1950s. We have uh, interviewed and examined patients that he treated in June of 19, 
uh, 49 and uh, a woman, of course, in her 70s now, and, um, and she's doing fine. So he had this figured out early on. Uh, it took him just a couple years at the university to figure it out, and, um, uh, but really ran up against uh, a roadblock with the medical community, which at the time was uh, highly enthusiastic about um, surgery and didn't want to hear about a non-invasive technique from a, uh, a doctor with a Spanish accent who came from Iowa. I mean, quite literally, they just didn't want to hear it. Um, he published his results back in 1963. Um, uh, he later said the work was read carefully, the deformity was not understood, and the work was ignored for 30 years. That's true. Um, he went to New York University to demonstrate his technique, and they called him a crazy old man. Um, uh, he uh, published his research on prenatal development, and um, he was told that you people in Iowa just wear big boots and muddy fields, and this won't work in New York City. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of bias involved in, in his work and a lot of uh, uh, fact that he, um, uh, his work was uh, discounted by the medical community. And, uh, and but even in 1980, they said Iowans don't care what their feet look like, they're all farmers. So um, uh, there were some real challenges. And then in 1996, he published a book with all of his results. And 1998 published information on the internet and things exploded. So um, uh, since then, um, uh, well, beginning in 1998, there really, uh, he gathered some international attention, including Rotary International. The first project that um, uh, took his technique and did a study to actually show that it can work other places than Iowa, because that was one of the criticisms. This technique only works for Dr. Ponsetti. Nobody else can do it. Uh, in 1999, uh, a Rotary project, a joint project between the Rotary Club in uh, uh, British Columbia and in Kampala, Uganda, um, they put together uh, some resources and a project and, um, and actually demonstrated for the first time uh, to the world that you could train medical officers like physician assistant equivalent people in Uganda to do this technique and be highly successful. In fact, here's a, a photo from uh, 2002, I think it is, where the president of Rotary International visited the project in Uganda and um, uh, sort of participated in what was going on. So Rotary was in on the ground floor in terms of promoting this technique uh, internationally. And then in 2006 here at the university, um, we formed the Ponsetti International Association um, with the goal of promoting Dr. Ponsetti's technique globally and trying to reach every one of these 200,000 kids. Um, the Ponsetti International does a, a lot of different things. Um, we develop databases and clinical guidelines and, and oversee research projects and web conferences and seminars. Um, uh, but let me just mention um, a couple of the things that we do. The main one being to train healthcare providers in different parts of the world to, uh, to apply this technique. It seems simple enough, but it's just not a matter of let's put a cast on a kid. Uh, the manipulation, as you saw from the video, of the tiny little foot uh, is, um, requires some real precision and some real attention to detail and takes, takes a, a while to learn. You probably need to do 15 or 20 cases before you're really skilled at putting pressure where it needs to go and aligning the bones in the order that Dr. Ponsetti uh, figured out. I'll just mention one other activity It was kind of fun that we do. Um, uh, we came across sort of serendipitously, and that is World Clubfoot Day. You know, there are all sorts of world days, you know, World Hand Washing Day, World AIDS Day, World This Day, World That Day. Um, back in 2013, we thought, why don't we have a World Clubfoot Day? And the question is, how do you declare a world day? And I can tell you how we declared a world day. We went to Wikipedia and looked at the list of days and saw that on June 3rd, Dr. Ponsetti's birthday, there was no world day. So we just typed in World Clubfoot Day and sent out messages around the world saying June 3rd is World Clubfoot Day. And it's been really, really uh, amazing. The people who use uh, that day as an opportunity 
to make people aware of of, uh, of clubfoot and aware of the fact that it can be uh, it can be treated uh, quite simply and inexpensively. Here's just some examples. The middle picture at the bottom here is Karachi, Pakistan, uh, Chile, uh, Nigeria on the left. So it's uh, it's taken off and um, something we kind of just did on a whim that worked out, including uh, this last year where we did a virtual family run uh, around the world, uh, like most many people are doing these days, things virtually where everybody does their own thing. But it was really quite successful, and uh, Todd did a uh, fantastic job of orchestrating this in uh, in all sorts of places. Okay, in 2015, so five years ago. Um, uh, uh, Rotarians from our district here, 6,000, and your district up there, 5970, got together and um, uh, got recognition by Rotary International of the Rotarian Action Group for Clubfoot. And, um, you know, there are a number of uh, action groups. It's basically a uh, collection of Rotarians that have a common cause they want to promote. And you see the list here of the different ones you probably know about water and sanitation and some of the ones that get a lot of bigger publicity. But um, Clubfoot is in there and um, it's been uh, very uh, helpful in terms, again, of promoting Clubfoot and uh, interest in Clubfoot within Rotary. Uh, the uh, Rotarian Action Group very simply functions as uh, these two things, a global clearinghouse and a project facilitator. So it's basically uh, the role of the Rotarian Action Group is to coordinate people that have interest in doing something about uh, this problem in, in their country, in their community, um, in their districts. Uh, and that includes, of course, uh, writing grants and doing publicity and supporting World Clubfoot Day and supporting local clinics and, um, uh, uh, you know, the usual things of, of supporting the causes that they're interested in. These are some of the things that Rotarians uh, uh, can do and have been doing. That is support training so that there's someone in their community or their country that uh, can apply the Ponsetti method, um, promote public awareness to get rid of the stigma and, uh, and the negative um, uh, feelings about Clubfoot as a curse from your ancestors and such. Uh, set up uh, systems for referring patients to the treatment centers. Uh, a big one here, of course, is to assist families and caregivers with support like transportation and, and housing and food to go to the clinic since uh, kids with clubfoot need to go back to the clinic every week or 10 days to get their cast changed and they need to, um, uh, to have a brace that works and sometimes even the 15 or $20 brace is a obstacle in, uh, in certain countries. And then to advocate, advocate with governments and healthcare officials to, um, uh, to make the Ponsetti treatment an integral part of the country's healthcare system. So that isn't something special. Uh, if you have appendicitis, you go to the hospital and get taken care of. If you have club foot, you go to the, to the hospital or the clinic and get your foot fixed with the Ponsetti method. So our long-term goal is that the Ponsetti method is no big deal. It's just a standard of care for kids born with clubfoot. Um, one of the things the, the RAG does, um, the Rotarian Action Group, is to help promote global grants. And um, we've been working with a number of um, clubs, districts uh, around the world to, uh, to submit grants. And Rotary has been very, very receptive and helpful. I'm going to give you two quick examples. Um, uh, and that is what's going on in Colombia. I mean, I heard the mention, I think it was Steve mentioned his Colombian coffee. Um, well, Colombia is one of the countries that um, we've been working with, the Rotarians there. And um, uh, a couple of years, a little while back, developed a, uh, a, a grant uh, uh, program with the Rotarians in Colombia. Um, Colombia, just as an example of a, of a, of a typical um, country, uh, we estimate has about eight here, um, and um, uh, and that would require approximately 28 uh, treatment providers. If there are 28 skilled healthcare people who know how to do this technique at strategically placed locations within the country, they'd be able to treat every one of these 800 kids every year, um, and uh, we proposed a 24-month project. It would cost $105,000. And um, uh, 
to, to do the training, to bring the doctors in, to train them for a week and so on. Uh, and then shopped around to these different clubs, including the downtown club there in Cedar Rapids, um, and the one in Vail, and the one in Marco Island, and two clubs in Columbia. They each pitched in some some uh, uh, funds, and uh, we, and then of course the the money gets uh, uh, multiplied with district designated funds and with the. Uh, international foundation funds and we were able to put together the budget to do this project uh, this was an example uh, back in september of 2018 we did the first training in uh, in cartagena um, the uh, lady on the left up here in the top corner is uh, dr uh, uh, astreed from uh, from colombia she's a orthopedic surgeon and a rotarian in colombia the main uh, uh, contact person there in colombia and the gentleman next to her is Dr. McQuinday here from the University of Iowa, who travels the world teaching teaching Dr. Ponsetti's method. Uh, the lady in yellow that you see on the right side there is um, Dr. Irana from uh, uh, Mexico, and she also has been a uh, active trainer throughout Latin America, um, and and uh, part, help, uh, helped out with this with this training project. Um, and then, of course, the, the typical rotary project or photo of uh, the people involved in uh, the training that went on in Bogota uh, later that month. Uh, and that project is going extremely well. Um, and uh, I think we're, we're not only trained, have trained not only 28 uh, that we started out with, but well over 30 physicians because there are others who heard about it and jumped in the training. And uh, I think uh, we can fully expect that um, uh, within a year or so, all the facilities will be set up to, to treat those kids throughout the country of Colombia. And the second example I'll use, and then we'll leave some time for questions, is um, uh, back in March of um, uh, 2017, I think it was, you see this little article in the middle in the, in the Rotarian magazine about Nigeria. And what that article said was that three district uh, clubs in Lagos, Nigeria, pooled their money. Uh, and were able to treat uh, 210 indigent children in, in the Lagos, Nigeria area, a city of about 14 million people. Um, and uh, the person who did that uh, training, who spearheaded that, uh, is this uh, the doctor here who actually came to the University of Iowa in 2007 to work with Dr. Ponsetti and be trained in the method. And he has since promoted this method throughout, um, throughout the, his country to the point where there are, uh, as the last count, about 70 clinics in Nigeria, uh, the largest, the most populous country in Africa, about 70 clinics that have skilled providers to apply the Ponsetti method. And in this case, uh, the, the Rotary Clubs in, in Lagos pool their resources to, um, to uh, um, provide that treatment for those kids. Let me show you. Just some real life examples. Here's our buddy Rilwin on the left uh, I showed you when uh, he came into the clinic. And here he is on the right after he's been treated, even at the age of um, uh, seven or eight years old. We didn't know exactly how old he is, but seven or eight years old. Now he's not walking perfectly, but he hasn't walked his whole life. And in a matter of five casts, the gentleman here that you see on the left is Dr. Uh, Adeg Bahingbi. And, and he was the treating physician who uh, straightened out Rilwin's feet. And uh, what you see Rilwin sitting there with is in his school uniform because he's now able to walk to school and go to school for the, for the first time. So this was pretty short term after he, his feet were straightened out. And um, he's since uh, been doing very well in terms of um, uh, integrated into a school and working with his chores around the house and, uh, and being part of his family. And then this is one of my favorites. This is Octavia. I showed you him a 10 year old boy from uh, Brazil. And you can see that uh, he has a little different future ahead of him. Uh, and, uh, uh, and probably for much of his life, no one will ever know that he had, uh, he had club foot. And again, he was treated by one of the doctors in Brazil where we've had a rotary training program for about four years now. Um, one of the doctors that was uh, is part of that, uh, she's also a Rotarian, 
uh, I was a pediatric surgeon. So what do we do about clubfoot uh, disability around the world? We, uh, on the big picture, we need about 4,000 trained treatment providers strategically placed in clinics uh, and hospitals around the world. Uh, we're working on doing that training with the Ponsetti International Association. Um, they all, all these kids are going to do need high quality affordable braces and clubfoot solutions as uh, is a major player in helping meet that need. And then uh, the, the Rotary Clubs, since they're in every community basically around the world, are uh, on the ground and uh, in a position to help actually make this all work in terms of making the clinics sustainable and providing the resources needed to help uh, uh, parents uh, deal with their kids. Over the next 10 years, there will be 2 million uh, children born with clubfoot. So uh, there's clearly a, a need, but um, the target, of course, is to get to every one of these kids and give them a little better uh, chance at life. One of the uh, taglines that we use, and I think it's a, a very appropriate one, is that the Ponsetti method is really Iowa's gift to the world or gift to the children of the world. Um, and it's a uniquely Iowa um, uh, technique developed here in Iowa, promoted here finally uh, in Iowa, and, um, and promoted globally. And with the Rotarian Action Group uh, located here in Iowa, it's the focal point of um, the Rotary effort to, uh, to do something about this, uh, this problem. Um, this is just some place you can get some more information if you're interested. Um, the Ponsetti International Association website here at the university. Um, the Rotarian Action Group website is quite simple, rag4clubfoot.org. And then uh, the Clubfoot Solutions, some of you know about that. Um, I'll, I'll put in a little pitch and say that if you really want to learn more about Dr. Ponsetti's life story and about Clubfoot, um, I wrote a book uh, a couple months ago published uh, uh, by Ice Cube Press uh, that describes the whole process of Dr. Ponsetti's life, how he got to this technique, and then what the um, international effort has been uh, to promote that technique. Um, uh, if you're uh, if you're really interested, and it's a, it's really a great it's really a great story um, uh, in terms of the obstacles and and issues that Dr. Ponsetti overcame to uh, finally get here in Iowa, and then the work that he did over all those decades, trying to continue to promote the best possible treatment for these kids. Okay, I uh, since I'm in charge here, let's see. I have to stop my screen share. Oh, he, <clears throat> thanks, and, Tom, for for sharing sure. sharing that. Uh, we're just about top of the hour, but I just want to open it up. Maybe we have time for just a couple questions. Is there any evidence of infants who receive the treatment who are able to attain a high level of mobility? For example, like a college or professional athlete. Uh, well, you probably all know the name of uh, Charles Woods Woodson. Uh, you probably all uh, uh, know the name of Christy Yamaguchi, a gold medal winner at the Olympics. Uh, she was born with clubfoot, treated with this technique, and her physical therapist told her to take up ice skating to strengthen her ankles after she was treated for clubfoot as a young child, and she ended up winning a gold medal. So there are there are um, and there are a number of professional baseball players. Um, uh, Major League Baseball players and um, and others. So there's a um, uh, and there are a number of uh, star athletes, uh, high school athletes here in Iowa that were born with clubfoot, and um, you know nobody knows or pays any attention to it because, in fact, for a lot of the kids, they actually have to look at their baby pictures or, or hear the stories from their mom and dad about what it was like to be treated because they're treated at a month old, uh, you know, a couple of weeks old, a month old. They remember wearing these stupid shoes when they had to sleep, but except for that, um, uh, there are individuals that, that just have no recollection or no awareness that they were ever born with club foot. So um, uh, for all functional, for all, uh, and the data would show there's a 35 year and 40 year follow up. In fact, a 50 year study recently published and um, you know, the, there, there just is no no long-term uh, uh, deficit. If we take the United States out of the equation, what um, what percentage of, I guess I'll say parents, 
are compliant through the child's fourth birthday? Uh, very difficult to say. Um, I would, you know, because the statistics and the data in many developing countries is virtually non-existent. I mean, you don't have a, you know, you don't have a, uh, uh, an internet database to go to. Um, I would just say from my experience, and I've worked in a lot of different countries and, and um, uh, looking at follow-up, I think it, it just relates a lot to the education level and the economic uh, status of the parents. The ones who better understand the importance of this. Um, and the, you know, I mean, when you put a student kid that made a little blood and it rubbed in a blizzard, it's surprising, it's very off, 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 and I think on the um, education level of parents and the economic status uh, and the ability of the race, that's a critical thing. I mean, you can imagine, you about the nuclear, right? And you can imagine, they're in pursuit of economic because they're um, uh, not that family say, time out, you know, take it off for a little, well, then probably what's happening. So, the race really is key. There's no question. Uh, the, a good person. Thank you. Thank you.